it's Jordan. Before we dive into this episode, it's worth noting that this was recorded over Zoom and there was a few internet connectivity issues, especially in the first question, but if you stick with it, it does get better. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Film Kid Asks, the podcast where I ask questions to working professionals in the film industry from the perspective of someone just getting started. My name is Jordan and today I'm joined by the Canadian production designer and art director from projects like Fargo Season 1, Heartland, and Winona Earp, Trevor Smith. You can also see his work on the upcoming film Let Him Go. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Trevor. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So... I feel like the art department is one of those roles in film that doesn't have the same kind of visibility as directing or cinematography, but it is a vital part of any project. So could you walk me through just quickly what the art department does for those who don't know? Yeah, I think the art department essentially creates the visual world of the film. That is the universe that the movie happens inside of from a visual standpoint, whether that's uh, the period that it's in, the locale, all those details and all those things you take for granted that are in the frame that have had some kind of a decision behind them, whether it's a, a location or a studio build or a visual effects environment that's completely created from scratch. Um, any way you slice it, the design or the art department really is creating the, the world of the film on a case by case basis. Yeah. So specifically you're the head of the department as a production designer. So what does that role entail? The designer works hand in hand with the director and the cinematographer and producers, of course, to define the look of the film, the visual strategy, and work with them to collaborate and sort of create the look, the aesthetic that's going to be the movie or the TV show that you're going to experience later. So we have to make sure early in prep that we're all sort of paddling the same direction referencing the same movies, working with the same color palettes, and like I said, sort of aesthetic strategies, so that everything is in sync, to be honest, so that there's no surprises, and that it, we really are sort of this, at least on camera, this, this triangle of power between director, cinematographer, and designer, and not to diminish the value of wardrobe, of course, hair, makeup, props, all those people that contribute, but we're sort of, I would argue, the big three that really create the look of the movie or the show that you're watching. For sure. So now I'm going to kind of jump back to your origin story. So you were originally studying music before transitioning into film. What prompted that change and has your background in music helped in your approach to filmmaking? Change was really just one of those gifts from the universe. I failed my hearing test in getting into jazz school and I was in Europe that summer and just couldn't get back to it. So it was just one of those life events that sort of steered me in a different direction. But I was already at that juncture as a contingency um, enrolled at the U of A in the film program as a backup plan, frankly. And that just turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to me. I was already a budding cinephile at that point. I had sort of determined that there were certain movies and sort of TV experiences that I found more intriguing than others. And I was kind of becoming selective about the sorts of movies and, and storytelling that intrigued me. And so I was becoming, you know, at an early age, kind of snobbish about what I was watching and interested in particular kinds of movies outside the norm. And so I just sort of fell into it. And then, you know, musically speaking, I still played in bands and I still pursued music on the side. And it's pretty normal, I think, for a lot of creatives to sort of dabble in many arts. That I think, if nothing else, I always imagined making a movie like being in a band. Um, and, you know, of course, on a show by show basis, the band members change. It's almost like a bit of a folk fest type situation where you get on stage and jam for a while. But there's a notion of collaboration and adaptability that I really like. And I think that's a transferable skill. Like you sort of feed off each other as if you were almost playing instruments. So the director might have an idea. And a lot of these ideas happen early in prep when we're driving around in a truck and still conceiving a movie because we often ourselves don't entirely know how it's going to look and feel. We're finding it ourselves on the ground, whether it's locations that are inspiring us or um, morphing studio designs, feedback from producers, who knows? So it's hardly in cement when a director lands and joins us and, and the cinematographer. So it's a work in progress, um, day by day, frankly, shot by shot. Now, that's the beauty of filmmaking, and I equate it to music because it really is musical i mean it's it's moments in time it's it's a bunch of human beings getting together and for this moment in time whether it's raining or the sun shining fighting their way through that scene and adapting all the time there's so many notes in the song 
that I think a music to film sort of comparison actually fits pretty well as a metaphor. Yeah, for sure. So as you mentioned, you did actually go to film school after studying music. So what are your thoughts on film schools and programs? And is there anything about your education that you would have changed? No, I'm actually really grateful for the path I took. I studied film first as as a humanities degree uh, for four years and then came to SAIT here in Calgary. That's what brought me here to study film from a production standpoint in a, I guess, a college or a diploma type standpoint. That was two years. Um, So myself, I don't have any regrets. And I know there's all sorts of different forms and types of film school across the country. Um, What I'm encouraged by that I'm seeing between a lot of institutions is a bit of a blended program now. I think, again, because I really am a cinephile, it's not just movie making for me. It's a a craft and an art form of the 20th century and 21st now. That I really like programs that are, I guess for lack of a better term, deeper and a little more robust, where you can approach both theory and understand the history of film and where, you know, the people that have worked before us and there's their contributions, because it really is an echo chamber. There are no original ideas necessarily. We've known that for thousands of years. They just sort of get rehashed in different shapes and forms. So I, I'm sort of rambling, but I guess what I consider a successful film program is one that's not just about nuts and bolts, as much as that's helpful and it gets people out the door and into the trades, if you want to call them that, and gets them to work. But I think something that also at least talks about the craft and the art of filmmaking, you know, every component of it, and, um, you know, from screenwriting to editing, um, cinematography, um, the context of history, you know, like the Italian neorealist or the French New Wave, these things happened um, not in a, in, a, in a vacuum, but they happened for all sorts of political and historical reasons. So uh, it's no different now, as much as we like to think that these movies are just these, you know, things that come down from the mountain of Hollywood. They actually are a happening culture, and, and whether we see it or not, we're in there and vice versa, it's reflecting back on us. We may not know it till we look back on it 10 years from now, but it really is a mirror um, to society. And that's what I love about cinema. It's what we want, or the stories we want to see. And um, a good film program, I think, in my opinion anyways, doesn't lose sight of that, that it is an art form and yes, it's an industry. And that's what makes it so frustrating and and awesome at the same time. You can get paid and um, do all sorts of great work with great people all over the planet. But no matter what, whether you're 10 people or 150, uh, you're still making something that's fundamentally artful on a day-by-day basis. It's, it's primarily unpredictable. And um, as much as everybody's organized from the director down, there's just a, a myriad of moments that are happening before our eyes. And those are the movies and TV shows that we get later. So I think it's quite magic. For sure. No, I love, I love looking at how history and culture is reflected in art. And I think that's uh, one of the things that definitely excites me about the the film program that I'm in. So early on in your career, you did a lot of music videos on Super 8 and 16 millimeter film for local bands. What were some of the important things that you learned from those projects? Well, um, I guess stating the obvious, they were independent and small and not full of resources and money. So, but I think it's important for every you know, filmmaker, whether they're in school or not, that they're starting with modest means. And I think a lot of really good core skills and instincts can come from that. So the one thing I think I learned the most from those was actually instinct. Um, this idea that if you really know what you want, and even if you don't know it, if you feel what you want, and your crew is small enough and they're willing to roll with you and collaborate, there's a real magic sort of agility and low budget um, sort of can-do versatile attitude where you can really just express yourself. And over time, you, you just get better and better instincts with anything, I suppose, any craft. But as a filmmaker or, or a head of department within film, the more you do it, stating the obvious, what is that Malcolm Gladwell says, 10,000 hours and you become an expert? It just gets in your blood. But what happens when it gets in your blood is that everything gets easier. You trust your instincts, you're full of less doubt, And as a filmmaker, when I made those music videos, you know, I just leaned on my intuition. What what is a strong frame? What is a compelling piece of drama? Um, You know, and reacting. Sometimes, oh man, look at the the way the sunlight's hitting the front of that house right now. Let's move that scene over there because we've got this free production value, this magic thing that's happening right now. Or, oh my God, look, those three horses just came to the fence and they're grazing over there. We couldn't afford the horses but they just happened to come by because we were shooting nearby and you just sort of turn around and you pick off a little bit of B-roll or something that might be useful. So 
I think that's the main thing. What I learned in music videos was obviously, you know, you shoot a lot, you have a lot of fun, you can afford to be playful and risky in the edit. But I think I learned to trust your instincts, to just follow your nose and your eyes, what's interesting, what's exciting to you, and not to lose that even when you move on to bigger productions. Sometimes it's, it gets to be such a machine when there's 30 of us getting out of a car trying to decide where to put the camera. It can be kind of a drag and you kind of lose some of that magic that we had as early filmmakers when you just grab the camera and a tripod if you're lucky and you sort of figure out what's really exciting and you sort of hop around and you, sh you, know, you shoot a bunch of stupid things, you put a camera in a sandbag. And uh, that's really, that's really um, liberating. So I think, uh, I hope, that I still am maintaining, whether I'm, I'm filmmaking or designing, that sense of adventure and playfulness that comes with being unrestricted, you know, a little bit lo-fi and not losing that. Using the, the music metaphor again too, right? Like just a super loud guitar and some drums is awesome. And uh, less is more is sometimes uh, really, really fruitful. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, incredibly important to hear as film students and, and very inspiring. Um, so you worked, at a video store as a clerk, and that exposed you to a lot of different films kind of early on. How do you think being exposed to such a variety of films has shaped your perspective? Well, I think uh, I've seen a ton of cinema, so if nothing else, I think I'm, I'm an expert <laughs> for sure. And I think what it's given me is this catalog of reference, what, as a filmmaker, or most importantly, as a designer, because again, films don't happen in a vacuum, TV shows don't happen in isolation. They all reference back to something else, something has come before. So I think seeing so many styles of cinema over time, seeing so many nations and ethnicities in cinema, different ways of telling stories, low budget, high budget, and everything in between, all that, if nothing else, I think has just given me a, a really strong catalog to pull from and syntax. So much of this just happens on the fly, all the, all the planning you try to do. But I think other filmmakers and creatives would probably agree is that so much of it sort of happens almost back to this band thing, like when you're in an SUV together, driving around on a highway, and you're talking and sharing ideas and getting excited about movies or shows you saw. And, you know, yeah, yeah, that's like this scene and that. And yeah, yeah, but his hair has got to be crazy, like so-and-so in that 1986 movie. And, oh, but remember the dress that the mom had in, you know, Back to the Future, you know, and, and on and on. And that's just how, to, how it sort of goes. So I think, long story short, is the classic video store clerk mentality having that experience, having all those reference points in your blood, it, it makes me a better designer, I think, I hope. And I think it makes me a better collaborator because I, I, I know what they're talking about. It'd be no different than a novelist asking about Dickens and you have no idea who Dickens is. It's the same thing. If they can't say, I want to do like a, a Godardian smash cut here or add some graphics, then you're just simply not speaking the same language. I think, uh, you know, I've watched more movies than I probably want to admit. And, um, I think it's all in there. It's sort of in my blood and I, cinema and, and television is, is where I work. For sure. No, I think, yeah, I mean, it shows that you have a passion for what you're doing and it could only help knowing more about, especially world cinema, I think can only help. So what are some of your favorite parts about working as a production designer in the art department? Um, I love the fact that I'm in so early, like that I'm part of the conceptualization process that I'm in soon. And I'm not just, and I'm not diminishing these roles, but I'm not just, um, you know, one of the people that work on set that show up, they get their sides that morning, what scenes we're shooting that day. And they're not necessarily connected to the overall arcing creative journey. Whereas I'm lucky, I'm one of the first guys in the truck, one of the first guys on payroll when a movie lands in town. And I'm, I'm part of that early work. And uh, I love that level of involvement because it, it keeps me invested and it keeps me creative because my voice is respected and heard and it's this great sort of chamber of ideas that a movie comes out the other end of eventually and again when people land they've got a script in their hand and an idea in their head but when they begin production on a movie or a tv show a lot of it's still unknown in front of them there's a lot of highway still to build and i love being a part of that road building like we're, we're scouting we're choosing actor availability all sorts of goofy things that are out of our control create frustration but they also create opportunity and before you know it you're shooting in this really cool rundown garage or back alley that you never expected but it's maybe the greatest scene in the whole movie and nobody planned it that way but sometimes that's the way it works out or the angle of light was just perfect that you know we shot an hour late that's 
that night. The producers hated it, but you know, the cinematographer loved it because we got that final hour of light. So um, that's what I like the most. I love the fact that the designer is involved with the director and the cinematographer and the producers really early on. I'm sort of authoring the, the show with them. And my voice is sufficiently loud, heard, respected that I do really do feel like a part of these shows, you know, even though I'm not the, the filmmaker or the director specifically, and it's somebody else's project, I think I'm really fortunate. Um, and that goes for the editor and the costume designer as well, and hair and makeup, some of those key creatives. They're painting with everybody else. We've all got a brush, so to speak, on the canvas. So that's really, that's, that's what I like the most. It's very rewarding that way, is that I feel like I've helped shape this thing. For sure. So what do you feel is the most creative part of the job? Hmm. The most creative part, again, is are those early days. Not to diminish all the work that comes after because it's really fun. Um, but the early days are all the dreams. Those are the ideas. That's the reference. That's the sort of blue sky version of the movie. And we know that the realities of production hit and where there's never enough time in the day and never enough resources to build all the things we want to. But all that begins to shape and, and hue the sculpture into the shape that it's ultimately going to be. And that's the, the process. But what I like is the collaboration. I really do. I'm, I'm a bit of a broken record, but it's kind of boring just sort of getting your way all the time. I actually really like the soft skill challenge of trying to execute somebody else's ideas and making them better and, and making them elevated and richer and more remarkable. Um, that's the best part. And I like to think that they're doing the same with me. Again, we're all paddling the same direction, trying to make the most awesome thing we can that, you know, that affects people. So I love that. Of course, I love all the collaboration. I love the, the actual design, the set design, the graphics, you know, the decorating, the wallpapers, the materials, the props, the detail. All that stuff is amazing. And I take it for granted because I'm always surrounded by such great people. Um, but again, that's the point. I'm almost just like a tastemaker. There's so many people working around and for me that I can't be lost in the, in, in the weeds and the minutia. Not that it doesn't roll up to me and I sort of approve or steer those things, but a lot of great people are doing good work. You know, construction, paint, greens, special effects, set deck, props, the art department proper, hair, makeup, um, wardrobe. They're all contributing and doing their little bit. And I think that's really cool. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but that's, that's what I like the most is the collaboration at the high level at the front, you know, the blue sky sort of power when you're standing in a field and, you know, six, eight weeks from now, there's going to be a town here. Just imagine, you know, that, that's amazing. And then it's going to be taken down three weeks after they're done shooting or the beauties and the details too, like picking paint colors, you know, having a million chips all over the floor and a bunch of wallpaper samples and stain samples and carpet samples and putting together a house room by room. It's great. You get to spend other people's money. So kind of going off of that, how do you work collaboratively with the directors and the cinematographers and, you know, under the producers to help achieve their visual and stylistic goals for the project while also maintaining your personal tastes and styles? Well, I think respect and humility, making sure that you're always listening. I think I continue to work at being a better listener. It's a huge skill. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody doesn't have enough time. But you have to really listen and understand what each of those key creatives and producers, they have a voice too, are trying to achieve, like never sort of not lose sight of the prize, what it is we're trying to make here. It's Blade Runner meets X. It's Grand Budapest Hotel, but it's actually darker, you know, and on and on. So you never lose sight of the high level objectives because what happens, I think sometimes producers and also directors and cinematographers, they have to do a lot of the hard work in the trenches. Like they start shooting on day one of photography, and they're there, scene by scene, shot by shot. And I am ahead of the game. I'm checking in when I have to, but I'm working on the thing that they're going to be shooting on Tuesday. And um, I have the luxury of sort of slipping off that way. So what I try to do is keep them honest because sometimes they can get lost in the mechanics of movie making, the pressures, and it's enormous pressure. Uh, and sometimes I'm there to sort of protect them from themselves because I have the luxury of keeping an eye on the big picture so sometimes they get in areas, ah, ah, we won't shoot that, or I don't have time to turn around on the scene. It's like, well, you know that back when we stood here, you know, six weeks ago, this really mattered because it symbolized this, that, or the other. Or we really, we all fell in, let's not forget why we're standing here, is because we fell in love with that pond over there and the way the cattails looked. 
So let's not be so quick to blow off the cattails uh, in a reverse because you guys are feeling pressure or it's a bad day or some actor is misbehaving. So sometimes I find that's my role is to keep everybody focused, attentive to those initial bold and exciting ideas. That's so interesting. So kind of switching gears now, you also direct. So how has your work in the art department affected your approach to filmmaking? Well, they're so intertwined. I can't separate one from the other anymore. What I learn on both sides of the camera now just co-influences each other. But I think most importantly, I think I've benefited as an art director and a designer by being a filmmaker. And we've made this joke before, and I think I stole it from a mentor of mine, is that when we sometimes roll up in the survey process, or I'm taking them back to a site after a bit of construction's happened, we sort of say, in my movie, or in my version of the movie, so-and-so comes down the hill here, and they walk through this door, and they, the shotgun blast goes through this window, and that building gets set on fire. And then, you know, it's not, it's because I've had the luxury of sitting there with carpenters and painters for weeks and really thinking about it. And of course, they can throw my ideas entirely out the window. That's, that's entirely their right. But I find that as a filmmaker, I'm making my own version anyhow. I can't help myself. And I think that's a strength. It's not an ego thing. It's just that I get the same script pages that the, the director does and all the producers and the cast. But I have the luxury of standing on that same piece of dirt for six to eight weeks thinking about it. And they don't, like they sign off on it a few days in prep. They come back once or twice if they're lucky to check in on it to make sure there's no surprises or I give them photo updates. But I have, I have the most time, boots on the ground, to think about the scenes from a physical standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, from a geographic standpoint. I can watch where the sun goes down and how, what amazing things it does, right? So what I do, and it seems to be working, <laughs> is I, I do that in well in my version. And so when I orient the director, who I've hopefully built a friendship and a trust with, to a new location, a new studio set, I feel confident in walking them through how I have felt it was going to work, how it was going to flow and move. So that, hey, I, they, I thought in my version, they were gonna come through this door, swings into this, she's gonna open up to this scene where there's you know 18 people at the table, and you get a great wide shot over here, and we've got the backdrop over there, and so on and so forth. So you sort of sequence it out yourself. You can't help yourself. We're all filmmakers, really. And um, it's, I think it makes for better design when you actually think about where the camera's going to go and what the most exciting angles are. It can't not be an asset and a, val a value to everybody else because they walk into it, burrito in hand. Maybe they're having a bad morning. Maybe an actor doesn't want to come out of their trailer. And they're just like, oh, God. I mean, I got like a, eight people at the standard team. What am I going to do? And he's like, well... I kind of liked over here. I thought you could do a nice moving master, get this foregroundy thingy going on and, and get into the scene. And then if you come down this hallway, there's a really great, you know, sort of look at that table that I've never seen before. So those sorts of things. So I love to sort of share those little opportunities for them and whether they take them or not is up to them. But I think that's what I bring to the table as being not just a designer, but a filmmaker. I, I really am making my own version. I can't help myself. That's awesome. So kind of obviously going off of that, the art department just has this massive job on any set. So what are you thinking about and focusing on when you're breaking down a script for the first time? Um, I think it's some of the things I've talked about. When I'm, when I'm breaking down a script, I'm, it seems obvious to say it, but I'm actually watching for what the actors are doing. Like, you know, ah, there's you know, so-and-so is doing the dishes. Ma is making dinner. Dad comes in from plowing the fields. So that's going to be the boot room in the back. And you just immediately start to build this little universe that serves literally what's on the page. Um, and then you get into the details, of course, after that. But I think it's really about movement and blocking and detail. And then all the stuff that I can add, like what feels like an opportunity, you know, like so-and-so is reading a newspaper or young Billy's reading a novel on the couch. And it may not be on the page, but I, I'm lucky enough to know what young Billy hopefully is as a, as a, as a personality you know, construct. And, oh, wouldn't it be great if in 1953 he was reading this, you know, popular science thing, because that would really speak to this in his personality or that in the drama. So it's screening it for those kinds of opportunities too. Um, oh, wouldn't it be funny if, you know, in the office was a movie poster of this as a bit of an in-joke or a reference for all of us. 
Um, but really it's about movement. It's about the actors. It's about the drama when I'm reading a script and um, making sure that I don't lose sight of that. Because if you're not careful, you can. You sort of get caught up in your own excitement and um, start building things that are cool and maybe not functional or get lost in a design. And it can be, you know, if you're not careful, a bit sort of um, presumptuous or silly or not useful for crew um, and not serve the directors and the screenwriters needs really. So it, everything comes back to the page. For sure. So again, shifting gears a little bit now, cause you, you're a multi-talented guy. Uh, you were also the director of programming at the Calgary International Film Festival. When you were watching these films and curating the selection, what makes a film stand out to you? I think, again, because I'd watch, you know, three to 500 movies a year, it needs to stick out, right? And uh, that's such a, such a cliche thing to say. The real litmus test for me was always what I call the lingering effect. Uh, something that sticks, that isn't, doesn't just leave me when the credits roll. It's that film or TV show that I'm still ruminating on two, three days later. It's that one that's asking more questions than providing answers. It's maybe making me uncomfortable. It's maybe made me reflect upon myself or some late recent decision I've made or that I see a piece of myself in somebody or something. So it's those movies that have, you know, remarkability that stick with you because as a, as a programmer, Again, uh, you're inundated with so much cinema. I mean, we never think of the rest of the globe. I mean, America maybe makes 1,200 movies a year right now, but there's another 4,000 on the planet being made that are never going to see the light of day here in Canada or the U.S. So I think the luxury as a programmer is you get to see more international cinema, more varied minor and ethnic voices and different ways of telling stories. But it, for me, it was always about that, stick, that stickiness. A movie's got to stick around in my conscience Otherwise, it was probably too tidy. Um, I think a good book, a good piece of art, for that matter, a great song, a great gig you saw, isn't just over when the lights come up. Are you revisiting it? You're thinking about that guitarist's energy. Um, you're thinking about the scene that just haunts you, that you just can't shake. You keep wondering why it is that they hated this one character so much. So that's what it is for me in, in your shows, is that it's got to have honesty, it's got to be remarkable, but not in a showy way. It doesn't have to have high concepts or goofy turns or surprise plot finishes. It doesn't need those things for me anyways. I think it just needs to have intelligence and honesty and um, drama. And I guess, if nothing else, speak to the human condition, right? I think that's ultimately what we want from our art. Whether you go to the gallery tomorrow or at the cinema or the theater um, or read a book or a poem, or listen to music, you want it to resonate and speak to you and to have meaning. For sure. So I have one last question before I kind of open it up to everyone else. And that is, what advice would you give to someone who is just starting their career now and is aspiring to be in your position one day? Because I feel like it's not like nowadays with directing or cinematography or, you know, even editing, sound design. There's a lot of things now where it's very cheap um, and very accessible but obviously as students we're not building sets we're not uh, there's it's still production design is still one of those things that can be very expensive so what advice would you t give to students who are interested in production design that don't necessarily have the resources that you would have on a on a high budget tv show or movie well i think sort of one of my key takeaways as the developing art director or a designer or set decorator or props person and sometimes you can be all four on a low budget show. I um, mean, that's pretty normal actually, even in commercials in short format, is of course you work with what you've got. And it seems cliche to say, but it is true. And I think good creatives, directors, producers understand that and know that maybe if you don't have all the resources in the world to build, you need more time to scout. Or that if you don't have all the money in the world for locations, then you need to be really selective about angles, accessibility, all those things that are kind of boring, but important to consider. Because you're not a designer, you're a production designer. You're making a film, or sorry, you're making a series of uh, a visual space, a number of visual worlds for a production. So you have to think about, will the dolly fit through this door? Can we get cable up to the third floor of this place? Where are the trucks going to go? Um, where is the crew going to go? How far of a drive is it to where we're going to go for lunch? Um, it seems like silly stuff, but all that's going on in your head 
I think if you're a, a respectful value designer, you're thinking about all those things because you're not working in a vacuum. Your work is going to trickle down through another 15 to 150 people and affect their workday as well. Um, but I think the main thing is just versatility. The more you can be a bit of a jack of all trades and a bit of a renaissance person, or you can do many things decent enough. And I think if nothing else, it's, it's an impulse for visuals. You gotta be excited about it. I mean, cool things, you know, you, you're the sort of person that loves to shop. This is me, you know, uh, I, I love to shop. I'm, I'm very observational. I'm always looking, I'm always taking photos. I'm always cataloging interesting stores. Oh, wow, that strip mall actually is pretty much 1960s, except for that one sign. All those things, because what happens is you build this database in your head of things. Oh, I know where my Aunt Ethel has this insane ship in a bottle that I need for this short film that we're shooting on Saturday. So it's this sense of mentally cataloging. And I think a good designer, or art director, or decorator, you're doing it anyways, because you just think this stuff is cool. You can't help yourself. You're just a bit of a, a hoarder and a collector and you get excited with design. You get excited with detail and period and ephemera and cool posters and paperwork and signage. Um, the stuff, you have to be zealous about it. Otherwise it's gonna be an uphill battle. Um, you gotta be excited about artists and fashion and culture. Um, and I think you just take that, even if your film has six bucks, you take that energy, you spend the best six bucks you can. And, and I mean that. When I started, it was in a TV commercial and um, God, I think I had like a thousand bucks and I was wardrobe props, art the whole shebang. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just sat down, drove around to a bunch of stores, took photos, sort of catalog what all is out there. And then you got to do a budget. You got to figure out what things can I provide? What can I steal from my girlfriend's place and she won't notice and I'll bring it back Sunday? What can I borrow from my mom? What can I get at the thrift store? What can I get at the Interfaith? Those sorts of places where sometimes you can get away with an honorarium, right? Um, if you bring it back Sunday and you have maybe some insurance, if you're lucky enough as on a production, insurance goes a long way, that if you give them 200 bucks, they'll let you take 2000 bucks worth of stuff in a, in a truck. If you bring it all back and you give them the other thing you had to buy, you give them the free trunk that you had to buy at the antique store. So all this sort of, creative budget management is what we do. And it's no different whether I've got a million dollar budget or I've got a $5,000 budget. It's the same behavior. You, you distill it down to what's available to you and you prioritize what really matters. Well, if I just can paint this room blue, that will really set the tone. And if we're lucky, we'll steal a set of Ikea curtains from my brother. And uh, if we can convince the director to only shoot this one way, we won't have to worry about this wall, which is a real problem. It's the beauty of filmmaking is that there's nothing but parameters. You're being restricted all the time. And I think the sooner you get over the fear of that, it's actually really exciting. Cause you're like, oh, well, we can't look that way. That gravel pit is new. That wasn't there a week ago. So now let's just focus on making this 180 degrees really, really awesome. So those are just important skills. You gotta be excited and you gotta be resourceful. That's the word, resourceful. Um, you know where to beg, borrow, steal, buy, return, rent. Renting is big. Um, if you bring it back unharmed, a lot of places will do rentals. Uh, and you can do a simple rental agreement. Generally, it's anywhere from 10 to 20% of replacement value. And um, everybody goes easy on it. You're insured. And uh, you can take a lot of stuff and put it right back. And they can still sell it three to five days later. So I think resourcefulness, that's the word. And uh, excitement. Use your youth. Exploit it. Because... <laughs> <laughs> the days are long. It's a hard industry, you know, and we're one of those departments, the art department, the designers, the decorators, the props masters of the world where our work is never done. Like I would say, for instance, a grip or an electric person or a camera person, even they can only utilize the tools that are on their truck. Yeah. They've maybe got some tape on their belt and a crescent wrench, but if the DP asks for a third HMI and it's not there, it's just not there. So they have to come up with a new plan. But us as designers, we're always trying to do great work and the best work possible and the most imaginative work is that you can't help thinking at two in the morning, God, if I could only find that pink elephant that blows bubbles or that thing, I know it's out there. I swear I saw it uh, last week in an antique store somewhere. You're forever ruminating. And if you're not careful, you can get sort of <laughs> develop an anxiety disorder if you're not careful. But um, our work is this loose, ill-defined thing. So you have to have fun with it. If you're not having fun, it'll pull you under.
Like you've got to be excited. Like, oh man, we're going to turn this room into this office for this private detective. And you're just going to fart around and throw stuff on the walls and decorate and pile things up and write sticky notes on the computer and make it as real and, and fun as you can until the cameras get there. And that's the energy you have to build on is you got to be excited. And um, you can do that on a low budget. You can do that on a high budget. As long as you keep that excitement and uh, that resourcefulness, that's the word I think is that we, even in the big budget shows, you can't get the thing you wanted, right? It's not going to ship in time from Singapore, the exact thing. So like, oh God, okay, so what are we going to do with this thing from Montana now, right? So we're going to paint it green. We're going to add this thing on the bottom and maybe people won't notice that it's not this. So it's endless compromises. It really is. Um, and it's about making good choices under pressure. And that's where I think really, uh, from a designer standpoint, you're really a manager of taste to a certain extent. You just develop good instincts. You know what's going to work and what isn't. If you see a good set decorator or a good set deck buyer going through a store, it's really something because they just, they feel it. They're just in a, they go through an antique mall and they'll just fill like a cube van full of stuff and they nailed it. It's just, you get a feel for it. A good buyer just kind of knows. And usually they're within a hundred bucks of what their budget was. Like they just know where to get the stuff and they have a feel for it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So that's it for my questions. And I'm now going to open it up to a few of my friends. So I was wondering when it comes to working with a director, because I do think like, I guess, cinematography direction and art direction, it's like that three legged stool. Um, so what is like your ideal relationship with the director? Do they kind of give you free reigns or is it like um, really mutual? Like, what does that look like to you? Uh, good question. I've had successful, really invigorating relationships that are both ways. I've had directors that are quite controlling and have a very strict sense of what they want, a very specific idea of what they're after. But it doesn't mean that I don't have voice because again, it doesn't mean I can necessarily deliver everything that they want. Um, so that can be good. But of course, the most, I think the most fruitful, fun relationship is one that's collaborative. So you sort of get all your ideas out on the table, in the truck, on the whiteboards, early days, and you find your way together. Um, you're like, oh, well, we know that we have this great location that has this spectacular mountainscape, and we're going to build on that. We're never going to lose sight of that. But what else do we have to give? Do we have to horse trade with the producers for? So uh, maybe I'm not answering your question, but I think a successful relationship with the director is one that's open and honest. And I think... Yes, the director's hammer is bigger, and if he or she needs something to be that way and you've got the resources to do it at some point, yeah, of course. Um, but you're, I've never felt steamrolled or not, my voice has never not felt respected and allowed and heard. And I think that's the main thing is I think you need to have a level of swagger that you're good at your job too, and you have to trust your instincts. And uh, you can be wrong and you can get overruled or you and the director might have an idea and here comes the cinematographer two days later and he or she's like, are you kidding? I can't even shoot in here. So you know, like one idea is right out of the window and that happens a lot is you lose sight of everybody else's needs too. Like, what are you talking about? You guys picked a place that's like North facing. There's no sunlight in here and I have like one light. So try again, right? So it happens all the time. But I think I'm repeating myself a bit, but a good director designer relationship is, is trusting because the director has to give it over to you. There's only so much prep, whether it's a week or six weeks or eight weeks. You drive around, you have a bunch of boring meetings, you do a technical survey, and then they go to camera. And so does the cinematographer. And then it's up to me or you the rest of the way to then take care of them, to protect those ideas. And yes, you do your best. You go back to set and you show photos or 360 walk arounds or drone shots, whatever you have to do to keep them in the loop. But they're trusting you. Like that ship has sailed. They've given you the power to resolve these problems and to make these sets awesome. And they'll be there on the morning with a coffee in hand and you've done your work. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Does anyone else have a question? All right. Well, in that case, uh, I'm going to move on. I asked you to prepare five film recommendations, which for you, I'm sure, was an impossible task. But yeah, but especially I think focused on production design and, and your role. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how you managed it, but I would love to hear what those recommendations are. Yeah, sure. I, again, a list is just a list, and um, it's overwhelming. But one thing I do 
even whether I'm watching the Academy Awards or just thinking about great films or great editing or great design or great wardrobe, is always remind myself that the Academy Awards, anyways, they like to often award the most. And it's one of my long standing beefs with awards season and even internet lists, which I tried last night as well, <laughs> is of course, and it's, it's just human nature. You see more of something, and of course, it's wondrous and bigger and more expensive, and it just has an impact. That goes without saying. So often, the best costume design and is the one with the most dresses. We just know this. It's the one with the biggest, most number of beautiful dresses. That's just how it goes. Um, and same with production design is the one that's slathered on the most thickly. And that's not a criticism of those films. They're all gorgeous, but that's not my kind of cinema and no disrespect to those kinds of movies. And I'm, you know, maybe fortunate or not fortunate to, to work at that level yet in my career. So anyway, long story short is I tried to think about design in different ways and make all five sort of choices a little bit varied in terms of how they, they treat design. So it, it goes without saying that no filmmaker or designer can't not reference Wes Anderson because his universe, his style, his auteurist expression is so distinct. Uh, there's even, you know, Instagram follows like accidentally Wes Anderson. So we know when we're in a film of his, and that, that's because of the design and, of course, the shot structure as well. So, you know, it's easy to just say Grand Budapest Hotel because it's really gorgeous. Lots of beautiful pinks and wonderful frames. But any of his movies, um, Steve Zissou, his whole trajectory has been visually a designer's dream because everything in the frame is there for a reason. It's self-aware. It's highly fabricated. It's highly artificial. But it's gorgeous that's why we i think we love his movies so much is that they are so self-aware and every piece of art every prop every little cake box every little detail is there and it's been designed like crazy and it's been all color coded and um that is hyper design so we'll call it the wes anderson look and who doesn't love it it's, it's an amazing world to step into um so the grand Prix best hotel that's an easy one um and i was trying to choose something gritty because again, everybody always thinks of design as these big, high production value, Harry Potter-esque Avengers movie, super jumbo designs. And they are, are amazing. But let's remind ourselves that a lot of them are actually digital. And um, I'm still an independent filmmaker at heart. And I like locations and I like practical effects and practical stunts. And I like real and dirty and gritty. And so this jumped to mind only because a colleague of mine worked on it. And I do love it. And I think it holds up to the test of time is There Will Be Blood, the Paul Thomas Anderson picture. You could use any of his films, again, The Master, Phantom Thread, you name it. Um, again, there's a filmmaker that respects and listens and uses his designer to the full effect. Um, Jack Fisk did There Will Be Blood, and I worked with the art director, David Crank, on a different project. But uh, There Will Be Blood for me is A, an amazing movie, but it's beautifully Texan dusty and dirty and those oil derricks were all built uh, the bowling alley at the end the other thing is about it is it's unquestionably real like you don't think it's a movie set it doesn't have that aha effect which sometimes movies can have that they're so artificial that they draw i would argue too much attention to themselves um wes anderson walks that line but i'm all forgiven for that um so anyway there will be blood i chose but you can choose with that the master or phantom thread um, and then another filmmaker, um, for some reason I'm picking contemporary, I don't know why that happened, but um, Nicholas Van de Greffen uh, is another filmmaker that uses his cinematographer and designer to full effect. Uh, the juiciest one is maybe Only God Forgives, but you could just as easily throw in The Neon Demon and the great but super long and violent and maybe misogynistic series uh, Too Old to Die Young, still worth looking at. It's like 18 hours long, but that filmmaker, Reffen, uh, uses his designers to full effect. Like you just know that you're in a controlled universe where the lighting, the walls, the wallpaper, the spaces have all been so carefully chosen and the shots have been so collaboratively built together. It's, uh, it's awe-inspiring as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then two other movies, they both, funny enough, start with Once Upon a Time. I don't know how that happened, but uh, my, one of my favorite Westerns of all time is Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, I would argue that first opening credit sequence is cinema perfection. And I love Westerns. What I love about Westerns is that they're austere. You know, it's 
just like the West, you're building something against the great wilderness and great, all that nothingness, all that, well, all that wilderness. So the train station at the opening of Once Upon a Time in the West is pure design to me, right down to the sound of the windmill, the telegraph station waiting for the train to come, all those boards that go on for nearly infinity, and they all are cupped and aged and old. Um, never mind that sequence is pure cinema. You can watch it with the sound off um, and should as a visual experiment. Um, that piece of design, I think, is just masterful. So that's clearly where the director and the cinematographer and the designer were in step. And a lot of Westerns are like that. Like there, there's something against all that nothingness, which is in a strange way, is almost pure design. You're putting a thing, an idea, against this great geography. And I think that's really fun. We do a lot of that in Alberta, obviously, so maybe I'm biased. And the last one, again, just because I couldn't help myself, is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood just because um, those designers and decorators did such a stupendous job of recreating late 60s Hollywood. Uh, obviously they had a ton of resources and they used some CGI to help get them up and over some drive-ins and stuff like that. The work they did, boots on the ground, the attention to detail, the little in-jokes and the posters, everything about it, um, the back lot where they're making the Western, all the behind the scenes stuff. It's just had such a loving attention to detail it sort of took my breath away at times, all that neon, I'm a neon fan. So miles of neon signs and recreating old theaters and bringing them back to life. It's, um, it's inspiring to say the least. So there you go, that's five. Thank you so much, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. Um, and honestly, it, this was such a pleasure talking to you. I definitely learned more about art direction and production design, but also, uh, you so clearly have such a passion for foam and just the artistic process. So just in general, it was genuinely such a pleasure talking to you. And thank you so much for coming on the show. 